Aloha and welcome to Hawaii to PCC 23's main stage where we're streaming this year's PTC TV in partnership with the Tech Capital. I'm Jean-Marc Lima, the editor of the Tech Capital, and here with me I've got two special guests, Mark Kenzie, CEO of Digital Bridge, as well as John Mauck, also the Senior Managing Director for Digital Bridge. Uh, guys, thank you so much for talking to me. It's a pleasure seeing you here. How are you enjoying Hawaii so far? <laughs> It's fantastic. It's a great spot to have a conference. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on in these corridors, and I know you've been really busy. Uh, and you had your keynote this morning as well, which was very interesting. Um, and one thing that was particularly interested was that you spin a lot of the negative na narrative that we're having in the sector yeah. into sort of positive. So we have all this conversation around inflation, interest rates, market caps, um, debt is more expensive, um, power energy crisis. Of course, we have a war in Europe, unfortunately. Um, but how? What message have you got for the markets at this stage, and how do you fight all that back? Well, look, I think we, we spent most of last year talking about the things that could go wrong, and we put a series of things in place back in 2020 and 2021 to defend against the things that came in 22. So we weren't surprised. Um, interest rates, you can't do a lot about that, but we made a decision fundamentally as a firm to go out and place securitized debt in 2020 and 2021. We did almost $18 billion of securitized debt. We now have 75% of our debt across all of our companies is fixed debt that goes out eight years. And, and I'd like to say we anticipated that. And so um, good investors, good operators anticipate change. And that was something that we felt like was coming because you could see that there was too much liquidity pumped into the system coming through COVID. I think when I was out talking publicly on, on Zoom during the pandemic, I was saying at some point the dinner bill is going to come and someone's going to have to pay for the dinner bill. And now we're paying for it in the form of higher interest rates. So that didn't surprise me. It, look, inflation was a, a, a natural byproduct once again of the pandemic and a lot of liquidity coming into the system. But as we talked about this morning, we've seen this inflection point in data center rents back in 2021, where we see that 6% increase. And finally, after literally four to five years of, of the sector having no pricing power, we yeah. finally have pricing power again. Yeah. And so rates have moved up, escalators are there, a lot of our costs are passed through to our customers. So we, we, we work in a sector that has actually, I would tell you, has pretty good inflation protection. And that was the same as it was in towers in 2001. It was the same in towers in 2008 and in data centers in 2008. These are good businesses. And so if they're run well and you have good leadership that looks ahead, you're not surprised by inflation. You're not surprised by uh, rising interest rates. And then I would say on supply chain, some of our businesses performed really well and some performed not as well, right? <laughs> and I think what was interesting is our management teams that went out and bought inventory early, like Zayo and like Vertical Bridge, did really, really well. I think um, uh, in the data center space, some of our portfolio companies did extremely well. Vantage Asia did well because we didn't feel supply chain issues in Asia. Yeah. Scala did particularly well, yeah. which is an asset that John runs. And then I think uh, Vantage did well in the US, struggled a bit in Europe. Yeah. Um, and so it's very antidotal. Hmm. Uh, supply chain issues have really hit Europe pretty hard, hit the US kind of hard, didn't hit LATAM as hard, and certainly didn't hit Asia no. as hard. So again, some of these things in life we can control and some of the things we can't control. So when, when I put that slide up there today, I was like, look, the narrative has been, let's go focus on the negative things because it's easy, right? It's easy to talk about a sector that's in decline when you're just focused on interest rates and inflation because some management teams were not prepared for that. Uh, I, I've been a leader through both recessions, 01 and 08, and I, I'm not afraid of what's happening right now. I embrace it. I think what we laid out today was a vision for how you navigate through uh, a financial crisis or a set of you know, macro uh, crosswinds and we've made a very clear case on how you do that. You focus on great platforms, great management teams, you have access to capital, which we have, and you continue to keep showing up for customers and you build for them. And then what you have is, you have a set of numbers around our organic growth, our revenue growth that are kind of hard to argue with. You know, the best way to go fight a negative narrative around a sector is go out and put up positive organic growth. And that's what we did. So our portfolio got marked up in Q3. Um, and you know, the value of what we built at Digital Bridge is very strong, it's very durable. And that shouldn't surprise investors, it really should. Because if you study cycles and you go back to 2001 and you look how we recovered in 02, 03 and 04 from the dot-com crisis, you look at how we recovered in 2009 and 10 from the financial crisis, good businesses not only survive, but actually you can take more market share. Yeah. 
And that's what we did actually in 2009 and 10. We took market share. That's what we did in the back half of 22. And what we're doing in 23 is our portfolio companies are taking more than their fair share of the wallet because they're well capitalized, they're prepared, they have good customer relationships, they're very well run companies. And that's kind of our message to our investors. You know, I, I don't worry about people that don't invest with me. <laughs> I worry about the people that do invest with us, which is our LPs. You know, we have a couple of hundred LPs around the world that invest with us in our private funds. We certainly have our public investors that invest with us and entrust their capital. And we've been a good steward of their capital and we're gonna to continue to be a good steward of their capital. So a lot of this negative energy around the sector, I don't, I don't buy into it because my job is I wake up every day and John's job is we got to go out and we got to operate our companies. We got to show up and perform for customers and we have to show up and perform for shareholders. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah you got to navigate through the noise. Um, the, there, to, there was yeah. a panel session just, uh, I think it was two sessions after yours, yeah. uh, where people were talking about the, the, the cloud coming down, revenues are coming down. But when you look at it, they're still going up. They're just growing slowly than yeah. they were, but it's still yeah, yeah. billions of dollars. But this is exactly it's, what happened yeah. in 2009 and 2010 yeah. in the tower industry. Yeah. Okay, so we were growing at five to six percent organic growth. I bet that's not still bad good in a recession. It's still pretty good growth. <laughs> You're still growing. Tech. So well, we're still growing, and I think that's the message. And on the yeah. cloud side, what's interesting? It's a law of large numbers. I mean, yes, they're growing slightly slower, but thirty percent on a two billion dollar uh, revenue it's business in the cloud is still a massive number. Now it may be down a couple percentage points, but the business is doubling every three years. On top of that, when you talk about the backdrop today of capital being more scarce, inflation, all of those enterprises are actually now accelerating their outsourcing. So there's actually a larger market opportunity for those businesses that are well capitalized, focused on customers, right? And have a long-term view, not overacting the quarter, but saying, what do I want to do the next two, three, four years? Mm. And partnering with those customers, whether it's the cloud, the content platforms or enterprises. Okay. Uh, I mean, picking up on cloud, a big headline last year was Jim Chaynor's, uh, what he said about data center reach and how cloud is going to kill data center reach. Um, and data centers are the big shorts that he's betting on now. I mean, what's your take on that? Look, my, my take is... Please be um, controversial. <laughs> yeah, please, please. No, I, look, I, I, I'll probably be pretty boring about it because yeah. I, I don't believe it's news. Um, and I think, look, Jim's a sophisticated and smart investor. And I, I think I said it pretty clear today, which is you can't take the data center sector and, and sort of take one paintbrush and paint it. Hmm. Now, for a guy that does what Jim does, he's a sophisticated investor. He knows what he's doing. He's preying on pieces of information that, that can lead their it's not all perfect in the data center space. And so part of his thesis is that some assets are aging and they're older um, and they're, they're, they're facing declining rent rolls because these aren't the facilities of the future like we talked about this morning. So we're focused on hybrid cloud, we're focused on edge deployments, we're focused on building infrastructure for the next 20 years. And to be honest, the sector has been around for about 20 years when you think about towers and data centers. And so some of that infrastructure is aging. Some of that infrastructure is tied to managed services, which is outsourced cloud, which as you know, has been in, has been decreasing now for the better part of what, five, six years. So there are elements of our sector that, that will be challenged with this environment and therefore Jim is correct. But where he may not be correct is there are parts of the sector that are growing, where people are putting capital to work and we're getting the right risk adjusted returns for that. And that shouldn't surprise anyone. That's what I've been doing for 28 years of my career is, is taking investor capital, investing it, building great companies. And, um, you know, look, everyone's going to have an opinion on this. And my job is not to have an opinion. My job is to go out and execute. My job is to go out and do what we've told shareholders we're going to do. And then most importantly, execute down at our 27 companies. Those are the things that I wake up every day and I can control. And as it relates to interest rates and inflation, some of the things that, that Jim is talking about, we've gotten out in front of that and we've been very thoughtful about how to deal with those things. So look, there's elements of the industry that certainly someone could short and then there's elements of the industry someone could go long. It's up to Main Street investors and Wall Street investors to decide where they want to put their money. Yeah. We have to make a compelling argument that putting money with us is the right decision. And Jim has to make his own argument on why people should put money with him and why he's going to short uh, an industry or a particular stock. I don't fault him. It's hmm. part of the system. It's part of the game. But my job is to stay focused. I don't focus on him. I focus on what my shareholders pay me to do, which is go out and create Probably. values. Yeah, because I mean, when you compare this industry as well to other sectors, I mean, this is growing astronomically um, when you compare to other real estate segments. Uh, but speaking of that, and one thing that I have to ask you both is M&A, because you are huge when it comes to M&A, Switch yeah. being the latest one uh, yeah. with the IFC $11 billion, just, just $11 billion. Um, I mean, First, before we go into switch, let's talk about just M&A, that isn't M&A in general. Because yeah. that is changing. So all these massive headliner deals that we're seeing, 
um, they're becoming more, not as regular as they used to be maybe two years ago, because I guess there's less people to acquire, less companies to acquire. Uh, I mean, am I wrong, am I right? Um, how do you view the data center M&A space at the moment? Well, maybe I'll start, which is to say, when we think about acquisitions, we maybe have a different lens than others. We're not just trying to financially engineer. So the question we have is what happens after you sign the deal? Anyone can write an $11 million check in theory. The question is what value do we create? What's the alpha we create after that moment? And so our underwriting is really about partnering with the teams, building a business, thinking about understanding what the customer is looking for that maybe the market doesn't see. I think Mark this morning did a nice job of highlighting what we saw at Switch, for example, but I'm not sure the market fully appreciated. And so to us, that's pretty exciting. So we like to understand what we're going for and execute on our business plan. Uh, regardless for the noises in the marketplace. Um, you know, more broadly, when I think about M&A, I, I do think consolidation continues. Scale matters in this industry, as you want to think about problem solving and not just trying to be a landlord on the corner of First and Main Street, but really think holistically with a customer. So that's a big part of the thematic we have across Digital Bridge. And the other big lever, I would say, is this notion that it's buy or develop. We don't, we don't have just one trick we can actually shift those dials as we think about where the market is. As we look at a region, we may decide that's a better place to develop or to make an acquisition to accelerate growth. So we have a couple different levers, so we don't just have that one idea of let's buy and be a financial engineer, but let's actually focus on business building and partnering with executives. Okay. And we did that in 21, right? We had a little less M&A. We focused more on Greenfield. There was a lot of infrastructure funds that came into our sector. Yep. They hadn't really invested in the space and it pushed pricing up because more liquidity came into the system. So the platforms became more valuable. So we did a lot of greenfield in 21. And then last year in 22, obviously switch was a, a marquee transaction for us, but we also did about $7 billion of greenfield at the same yeah. time. So a lot of shovels on the ground, not just in data centers, but fiber networks, um, CRAN, ORAN hubs, small sales towers. towers. This is a much more connected yeah. environment uh, than it was five, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of that, because a lot of the, their investment went to Vantage. Um, yeah. So Vantage has been on a crazy journey growing. You call it a, a growth playbook. Um, they're going to be copying into other businesses they're going to be acquiring. So two questions to that. Yeah. One is, how is that growth playbook is going to play into your current portfolio, including Switch? Yep. Um, and then the next one is, what's the future acquisition? <laughs> 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 well, look, I'll, I'll let John talk about Switch. I think um, Vantage has been a real pleasure for both John and I. We we, we did that investment together. Uh, Surreal Chosky is just such a great partner. He's built a phenomenal organization. When we bought the business, had less than 80 employees, yeah. had like 37 million of EBITDA. Today, that business has grown 7x. I do actually say more than 7x. More than 7x. And the employee count has grown by 10x. Um, but most importantly, what Surreal does that I think is a great lesson for all uh, budding entrepreneurs or CEOs is um, this is someone who really bleeds for the customer. And he always figures out how to get to yes for a customer. And that's important. You've got to figure out how to, how to deliver for customers. And you know, uh, he keeps doing that. And I think as you do that, you get more at-bats, you get more chances to win. And, and the guy works seven days a week. He's tireless, he hires great people, he, he incentivizes them, um, and he motivates them. And I think the great leaders understand how to hire the best talent to motivate them and to turn them loose. And so it's been hard keeping up with him, yeah. raising capital for him, but uh, in this year, it, yeah, it is a good problem to have. High class I mean, problem, but a problem. But, but you, you say yeah. it correctly, because everything we do at Vantage is success-based. We've never taken a speculative build on risk. We just won't do that. We watched what happened to the data center industry in the mid, early 2000s when people were building speculative data centers and all that inventory got hung. That's something we don't do. We don't underwrite you know, naked data centers. It's just yeah. not something that's a good practice. I think on, on Switch, you're, you're closer to that story than I am, but... Yeah, you know. there's a number of parallels with what we see on the Vantage side. Really strong management team that is focused on the customer, right? And that to me is core to their business plan. Um, great execution, a great team that's got depth to it and can really, you know, really deliver, which is important. More macro, if we step back, back in 2017, we saw an opportunity to really accelerate the hyperscale cloud support and to partner with hyperscale cloud customers. Today, we see that same opportunity with private cloud. There isn't really anyone else other than Switch doing it as effectively. So we see a real macro thematic with a great management team, high quality assets and all the things we've talked about. So again, that's <coughs> been a big driver for growth and development. And then for what's next, I mean, look, we're going to keep working with management teams that we see out there, opportunities to partner and grow the businesses we have. 
we think that backing these companies as they scale is key. So that'll be a big part of it. And then we'll see where that takes us. Okay, just, just on expansion very quickly, because you are present in every continent, but one continent, you're not too present, it's still Africa. You're in South Africa yeah. with Vantage. Yep. What yep. is the plan for the rest of Africa? Well, look, I, I had the, the pleasure of, um, of, of backing a great entrepreneur named Tope Lawane, who built Helios Towers. Um, when I started Global Tower Partners in Tope and moved from TPG to go start um, what he was doing, Helios the Funds, um, I collaborated with him and, and really saw the opportunity to build mobile infrastructure in Africa where you don't have fiber, you don't have landline technology. So I was an early believer in that. I invested in that business and, and continued to believe in the continent. It's a, it's a, when you look at the numbers, it's startling uh, how many people are still unconnected in Africa and how can we play a part of that narrative? So, you know, we've invested in towers. We certainly have invested in, in the cloud and, and building, you know, the, the 100 megawatt facility in Joburg. Yep. And we've looked at a couple of different management teams in the fiber space, which we like and we've gotten close to. And, you know, it's, it's a continent that's on the come. It's maybe not for this particular fund that we're in, but as we look down the road, I think we're gonna continue to dip our toe in the water and we're gonna continue to invest there. I think this last cycle, we've been very active in Asia. That's a theater that we've really gained uh, a strong footing. And we're gonna continue to keep investing in Asia. We're gonna work certainly in, and I'd also put in Africa, you'd be reticent not to include the Gulf as part of that. So we look at sort of Africa and the Gulf as kind of one opportunity set. And I think coming out of the World Cup and just seeing some of the transformation that's been happening in the Gulf region, there's a lot of really good digital infrastructure ideas there as well. Oh yeah, you look at Saudi Arabia, I mean, it's it's a whole different world yeah. it uh, is. of pipeline. It is, and, um, and the country has prioritized digital transformation. And by the way, so is Qatar, so is UAE, mm -hmm. so is Bahrain, um, and soon Kuwait. So all, all these countries are very sophisticated and they understand the power of digital transformation. That's interesting. I mean, I could ask you 10,000 questions um, if I could, but uh, just one final question. If tomorrow digital infrastructure imploded and stops <laughs> to exist, what, what's your next big thing? Well, look, I, I think I've been pretty direct that if we don't figure out how to put back into the planet what we took away, we've got a real fundamental problem. Um, I'm not some environmentalist, I've never been, um, but I think as, as I've um, grown into this job and, and understand my responsibility to our LPs, to my customers, uh, to the countries we do business in, um, we don't think it's wokeism, we don't think it's, it's, uh, it's something that's a, a tagline because we feel like people are gonna be like, oh, that's a good job for you. We kind of have to do this, right? And it's not because that, you know, we think we have to do it because investors tell us to do it. We're doing it because we know it's the right thing to do. We know that it'll, it'll more importantly, it'll extend our businesses. Yeah. That's really important. Making sure that we have prominence and that we have uh, permanency over the next 20 years. I've spent 29 years getting to here. I'd like to finish my next 29 years making sure that we leave the planet in a better place than we kept it. And oh, by the way, our customers are demanding it. Hmm. I mean, if you were sitting here with Microsoft, you're sitting here with Amazon, you're sitting here with Google, and John talks to these guys all the time, uh, it's not a nice to have. It's gonna be a requirement. Yeah. You have to be there. And so that has to be part of the narrative. So we went out, we bought AMP Capital, uh, which is a traditional infrastructure manager that does renewables and uh, does digital transports and logistics. And so we're thinking about how to use digital to effectuate infrastructure in a way that could perhaps be very, very positive for the planet um, and could take less resources out of the planet and maybe we put something back in. That would make me pretty happy. Okay, and then Johnny. <laughs> it's well, ambitious. Well, maybe John has a better plan, I don't know. Let me say, by the way, a slightly different twist on the same thematic, which is energy is becoming table stakes of the conversation, and it's actually the natural extension of what we're doing. It's so critical to our data center and our strategy across it. But the other side of that is, if we didn't need data centers or digital infrastructure, we see what's happening with the digitization of every economic process artificial intelligence, applying technology to biological sciences. We're in the early innings of the technological transformation that's taking place. Mm. So there's a lot of things we see from our customers that are really interesting over the next 20 years. Now, we're in the right spot because we're agnostic to all of those and we're partnered to all of those technologies, but we're early in the shift that's taking place. So there's a lot of opportunity out there that's gonna drive, of course, demand for fiber and towers and data centers, so. Very interesting. Um, I mean, despite all the challenging, yeah. the challenges, this is an extremely interesting time not just for the sector, but for humanity. We're evolving to a new era. I, I think it's the most interesting time, actually. Yeah. And I think the the velocity at which information moves gets quicker, decision making's quicker, 
and this this notion of moving from a world of myopic sort of physical infrastructure into a software defined environment where you can tailor solutions and tailor ideas. Um, that's changing the planet. That's certainly changing our industry. And you'd almost have to say that, you know, software defined networking is now part of digital infrastructure. Okay. So think about sort of software defined networking as a as almost like as a SaaS model. Mm -hmm. Because that's honestly where where organizations like Nokia and Samsung and Ericsson as you know are going. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually Apple goes that way and other people. Yeah. And then once those go the world has gone. <laughs> the world, yes. Um, Mark Genzi, John Mock, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank uh, you. Good to pleasure. see you. Thank uh, you. As for your home, thank you for watching and do check the PTC and the Tech Capital websites for more exclusive content from this year's conference. Until next time, mahalo.